Good morning, everyone. This morning's Bible reading is from Deuteronomy 5, verse 22 to 33. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your assembly there on the mountain, out from the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness. And then he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the vo voice out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me. And you said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now, why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. The Lord heard you, and when you spoke to me, sorry, the Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Go, tell them to return to their tents, but you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commands, decrees, and laws you are to teach them to follow in the land I am giving them to possess. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Forsyth. I'm the vicar here at St. Jude, and a very warm welcome to you. Particularly if you are new or visiting, we are delighted that you can be with us, and we do hope that you can stay to enjoy morning tea, and indeed, uh, a well-cooked barbecue uh, in the rain, so it's sausages be nice and clean. Here at St. Jude's, we are in the middle of a series preaching through the opening chapters of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is actually a sermon, or really a series of sermons given by Moses as God's people are about to enter the promised land. Now, one of the key things that the book of Deuteronomy does is to look at the really important question, how do we live in response to the glory and grace of God? How do we live in response to the glory and grace of God? Now, of course, what is fundamental to that question is the big picture of, well, who do we understand God to be? Because, of course, the wrong picture of God will lead to a wrong response. And my uh, many discussions with people about God, it's funny when you're a minister and they find out, people are very happy actually to talk to you about their concept of God, is they're happy with a concept, that very thing, of God. They have a picture in their mind of what God looks like, and the picture I've given you is not an uncommon picture uh, of a uh, traditionally very uh, white old man with a grey beard, not unlike Santa Claus. And we are content with this thought experiment generally. And people will tend to imagine God as a kind of grandfatherly, Santa Clausy, benign spirituality. Safe, without too many demands, who helps out when needed. But as we read through Deuteronomy, in fact, particularly in Deuteronomy 5, we'll see that this, actually not a, a, this is not the reality of the true and living God. We see that God is not safe, uh, not benign, and demands all of our hearts respond to him. Very interestingly, the scriptures never tell us exactly what God looks like. 
They don't give us a physical description. What instead we often see is the effect of his glory and character upon people. Uh, Really evident, by the way, in Deuteronomy, just in the previous chapter, it's made overtly clear in chapter 4, verse 15, where where the Lord says, oh, Moses says in referring to, to the events previously, you saw no form any of any kind on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. In other words, God's people didn't actually get to see what God looks like. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why no image is to be made of God. No idols are to be made of God. Because actually we don't have a description. There are other reasons as well. And so what Deuteronomy 5 does is rather than kind of God is 5 foot 8, you know, or 6 foot 10 or whatever it is, actually paints a picture of his glorious character and his word to let us know how to respond. Now remember the context of this passage is right after God has given the Ten Commandments. This is the very following verses. And if you want to hear an excellent sermon on the Ten Commandments, listen to Sam's sermon last week. And so this is the response to hearing God's word. I want to suggest there are three things that we can pick out of this that are fundamental to how we respond to God. And the first one is we see that God's word is proclaimed. God's word is proclaimed. And that's kind of highlighted particularly in verse 22. And there are four things about God's proclaimed word we see in this kind of opening verse which kind of sets the agenda for the rest of the chapter. Moses says here, look, these are the commands the Lord proclaimed. And what you see actually in chapter 5 is this emphasis over and over again about speaking and hearing and listening and telling and proclaiming. Uh, 24 times in these verses is that idea of vote. Speaking the voice of the Lord. And what we're seeing here is a deliberate contrast to the gods and idols of the nations. Remember the gods and idols of the nations are made of stone and wood or precious metal. You can see them, but you can't hear them. They're silent. They say nothing. But here is the true and glorious God who you cannot see because you won't live, by the way, but who speaks clearly, who reveals who he is as he proclaims his word. So firstly, the word is proclaimed, and it's proclaimed, as we shall see, to all the people. The Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly. In other words, when God speaks, he doesn't just speak to one person, he speaks to all of his people. Why? Well, it's because those commandments, those words that he's just spoken, are not just for Moses, they are for how all of God's people are to respond and live to his grace. In other words, God speaks to all of us by his word. And thirdly, we see that when God's word is proclaimed, it is proclaimed with power and glory. The Lord proclaimed, and we read further on, there on a mountain from out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness... See, they can't see God, but they have these uh, terrible and beautiful signs that God is powerfully present. Uh, First, he noticed that on a mountain, in the Bible, by the way, any time someone goes up a mountain, something big's about to happen. It's a hint. It's where people meet with God. Secondly, notice there's fire and cloud together. It's like a volcano, isn't it? Remember, this is how God led his people through the story of the Exodus. It's a symbol of presence, but it's also a symbol of holiness and judgment. Fire, God's fire is something that consumes evil, we see in Numbers 11. And there's darkness. It's a reminder here that, that God is unseeable. He is 
He is inscrutable. You can't scrut him. That's, that's the, great, the great thing about God. He's so glorious and powerful. By the way, that's actually a mercy. Because humanity in its sinfulness is not equipped to see God in all his glory. It's a death sentence. So it's actually an act of mercy that God speaks. And fourthly, as the word is proclaimed, we note that it's a word that endures. Notice that, it, that he wrote on two stone tablets and gave them to me. By the way, the text doesn't say whether it was kind of like uh, commandments one to five on tablet one and six to ten on the other, or was it one to four which are about God and about six to ten which are about, or whether there's perhaps even the commandments are written equally on both because that would be a form of a covenant treaty where each copy, uh, each copy one goes to each member of the covenant. We're not told, but it could be one of those ones. But in either case, notice that it's on stone rather than clay. In other words, there's a permanence here. These things are to endure. It, it's not the post-it note version of God's law. Now, at our church, we have a very strict rule, I've been informed because I've broken it, that you're not to put blue tack, blue tack signs on the wall. Why? Well, apparently they'll have a mark. But they're the temporary signs, right? But if you look around, you can see we have stone markers in our church. Why? Because we want these things, and particularly to remember people, to have a permanence. And so we're being told overtly, God's word is not just a one-time thing, it's a temporary thing, no. There is an endurance to God's word that it endures forever. And so firstly, we see as we go through this passage that God's word is proclaimed with power and permanence. And secondly, what we see as, as we, were, we kind of told of this story is that God's word is glorious. Now there's been a hint of this already, but it's mentioned overtly. In other words, as God speaks and proclaims his words, he reveals his glory, his godness. It says in verse 24, and you said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and majesty and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. The, the, the point being made at that's unusual. Now the word glory means heaviness, weightiness, permanence, eternal. Uh, everything else in comparison to it is light and flimsy and fleeting. Now when I was back at university, I used to play, and you will agree this is an obvious thing, I used to play American football. I know you're laughing in agreement. That, that, in fact, I'm, I'm probably about eight kilos heavier now than I was when I played. I played at the princely, glorious weight of 69 kilograms. There were members of my team who weighed 145 kilograms. For those not good at math, that's more than twice my weight. And we would do tackling practice in training. And for some reason, everyone loved to go against me. There was a, a colleague of mine who played in the team, Manu. Manu weighed 140 kilos, so not the heaviest guy on the team. And we had a tackling drill where he had the ball and I had to stop him. And there were three cones marked out where he would run along. And at one of those cones, he would turn left and attempt to get past me. Manu went past the first cone, no change. Manu went past the second cone, no change. Now, of course, at this point, both Manu and I know what's going to happen. Third cone. He turns, heads straight to me and runs me over. The only thing that was in my favour is in the car crash that was my attempt to tackle him, I ripped a part of his sock off. And I, I, I waved it and said, hi, I've got your sock. 
at which point he turned around and tripped and fell over. <laughs> and the whole team laughed. But that's a picture of, of, of someone coming into contact with glory. A man who was far more glorious than me. You see, because when something is big and heavy and, and glorious comes into contact with something that is light and flimsy, the outcome is obvious. God's glory is a full body experience. It shakes everything about us. It is overwhelming in every sense. And this is where it comes. See, we might be happy with a concept of God, but the reality of God is something else entirely. See, the challenge is we need to never, ever water God down to a concept. Be aware of his tremendous and all-powerful glory. His tremendous and all-powerful word. Because if God is just a concept, then, then we shape him. We, do, we, we are heavier than him. We are more glorious than him. We arrange him. We shape him. He, he, he's safe. It's our agenda. It's not God's agenda. But to have an encounter with the most glorious God who speaks means that God arranges us. He shakes us. He is heavier than us. It's his agenda. It's his words. God's word is glorious. And therefore we must respond in obedience. Well, thirdly, this means that God's word is both at the same time wonderful and terrible. It's wonderful and terrible. Let me explain why. Um, it, remember the context God's just given the law, the Ten Commandments? And at one level, this word, this glorious word, is wonderful. Of course you should say, I say, I should live like this. Can you imagine a world with no murder? And a world with no, even just no lying? And no stealing with a concern for justice? Where people always love God and love their neighbor. That is a wonderful, beautiful, glorious picture. And we say, I, I would love to be a part of that world. It, it is wonderful. But at the same time, it's terrifying. It's terrible. Why? Because no matter how hard I try, I can't live like that. You can't live like that. Our world is a picture, a terrible picture of the fact that we don't live like that. It doesn't say, in breaking news, we continue our streak of no stealing for 2,000 years. Breaking news, no one's still been murdered and there's been no violence once again. If only that was the news, but it is not. And so God's word, God's law, is both something we can't live with and something we can't live without. We know it's worthy but we know we're not worthy. And so his word is both wonderful and terrible. And we see this tension in the text. Verse 25, notice, it says, but now why should we die? This great fire will consume us and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard his voice, or heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the fire as we have and survived? Notice the tension between verse 24 and verse 25. Verse 24, today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. Verse 25, we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. <laughs> it's wonderful and it's terrible. So how do you solve this problem of a glorious God and an unworthy people. 
Well, the people actually propose a solution in verse 27. Did you notice what they suggest? They say, look, we need a mediator. Someone to stand between God and his people. A go-between. And so they say to Moses in verse 27, look, you go near and listen to all that the Lord God says. You take one for the team, Moses. <laughs> You're qualified. Then you tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you, and we'll listen and obey. It's a safety mechanism, right? It's a good plan. In fact, verse 28 says it's a good idea. But there's a deeper problem. And the deeper problem is the heart of the issue. See, throughout chapter 5, there has been this unmissable emphasis on God speaking. And his people hearing and obeying. God speaks, people hear, people obey. The Lord proclaims, you have heard the voice, you have heard the voice, you have heard the voice, you have heard the voice. As I mentioned, 24 times that is mentioned in the chapter. You cannot miss it. So why is there so much repetition of this point? The Lord speaks, you, obey, you hear, you obey. The Lord speaks, you hear, you obey. It's highlighting the deeper problem. And the people are struggling to obey God and follow the law. It's not because they are hard of hearing. It's because they are hard of heart. It's, in other words, it's not their ears... It's their heart that actually needs work. Did you notice what God says in verse 29? Oh, that their ears would be inclined to hear me. No, he says, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. When God says he wants it to go well with them, uh, it's not just how we start our emails, you know, dear so-and-so, hope your day's going well. It kind of, it's, you're trying to find a polite way of starting an email without sounding rude when you really want something. It, it, the Hebrew word there is, is about deep human flourishing, not just a little throwaway line in your email. Like genuine human flourishing. I want to flourish in all dimensions, says God. That's what I want. But he starts with this, this kind of lament, oh, that... And once again, the original language there is this sense of unfulfilled longing. I would love this to be the case, but it is terribly not. Oh, that your hearts would be inclined, but they're not. And of course, in scriptures, the heart is, is not just the emotional center. It's, it's much more than that. It's who you truly are. What makes you, you. Your heart is what you worship with. It's what you give glory with. And when God speaks of fearing him, it's a reminder that God is not just a concept that we manipulate or control. To fear God is to express a deep and dependent sense of awe and wonder and love. To fear God is not to run away from him. To fear God is to realize he's the only one you can run to. In other words, to obey and to worship with all our hearts. That is what it means to fear God. Not run away, but run to. Why? Because he is not just God. He's not just the Lord God, he says time and time again, I am the Lord, your God. Once again, notice how many times he says, the Lord, your God. In chapter 5, 16 times. He wants to make the point again and again, I'm not just a God who's out there, I'm your God, I'm the Lord, your God. You are my people. It's relationship. I'm your God, yet your hearts long for something else. Oh, that your hearts would fear me. Why? Because I'm your God. I've rescued you. I've brought you out of slavery. I've given you my law and how to live. But yet still, oh, that your hearts would fear me. 
So what do we do with our hearts? Well, the world has a great option. It is you follow your heart. This is the Oprah Winfrey, right? You, know, the, you, you can do everything, just follow your heart story, right? Um, we can ignore God, his word, his law. Follow your heart. That's our worldview. It's a disaster. It's a disaster for human flourishing. Our world is replete with people following their heart. Religion says, no, no, you need to rebuke your heart. Your heart's doing the wrong thing. You need to try harder, work harder, follow God's law. But there's a problem with that too. Our hearts, when rebuked, are so stubbornly sinful that they don't actually change and actually, ironically, can get harder and harder to keep doing the right thing. The Puritans used to say that the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. And our old sinful hearts become increasingly more hardened, more stubborn, more religious, more self-righteous, not fearing God. So we can't just follow our heart and religion's a dead end. What's the solution? And the solution is the one that God himself provides. He says, I will actually give you a new heart. A heart that is soft and a heart that will fear me. In fact, I will give you a better mediator as well. A new heart and a better mediator. And of course, this heart transplant that we receive will, will occur hundreds of years later, not in a, a surgically clean operating theatre, but on a filthy and blood-stained cross. When Jesus, the only person whose heart was perfect, who lived a life of total obedience, who kept all the commands always, Died to give us life. Face the full fire shaking darkness of God's judgment. He took our disobedient hearts and gave us hearts of obedience. See, this is the astonishing love of God. He gives us the hearts we need to worship Him. To fear him. To find our true and perfect eternal, sorry, eternal identity in him at the cost of his son. And this, of course, makes Jesus a far better mediator than Moses. See, Moses was there to kind of act as a bit of a, a cushion, a conduit of information. That Christ has died to, to redeem us with God and acts as an eternal interceder on our behalf. This very moment, Jesus is mediating on your behalf. Even now, while you sit in church, wondering how long is this sermon going to go on? Christ, hears your cry. <laughs> right now. This means we can approach not just a concept of God that we've made safe, but we can approach the glorious, living, and even terrifying God as his beloved children because of Christ. As Hebrews 12, 19 puts it, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness and gloom and storm, to a trumpet's blast, or to such a voice speaking words to those who hear it, begging that no longer words be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. A sight so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. He says, you have not come to that mountain. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to the thousand upon thousand of, of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, 
to the spirit of the righteousness made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, which is purchased by his blood. That is the great and good news that we can approach our great and glorious God who gives us his word. Let me pray that we would do so with thankfulness. Our great, merciful and glorious God, we repent of all those times where we seek to make you a mere concept to try and shape you to fit into the box of our making. Father, may we be increasingly aware of your glory, your power, your might. We thank you that you are a God who in your mercy has spoken your glorious word. May we respond with humility to a word that is both wonderful and terrible knowing that our hearts, as sinful as they've been, have been washed clean by the blood of Christ who now intercedes for us and in whose name we pray. Amen.